Welcome to Episode 3 of Truth and Consequences with Doug Papa. In Episode 1, I discussed the unsolved 2016 Las Vegas Land Kaufman double homicide, Las Vegas Justice Court Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiasen, and we heard from Connie Land, whose daughter Sydney was one of the victims in the double homicide. In January of this year, I was contacted by an investigator for the Nevada Commission on Judicial Discipline. In December of 2018, Connie Land filed a formal complaint with the commission against Judge Tobiasen. The commission's investigator, Adam Wignansky, conducted a recorded interview with me concerning my interview with Judge Tobiasen in 2018 and the articles I authored that mentioned Judge Tobiasen, which were published by the Baltimore Post Examiner. The commission requested a copy of the audio recording of my interview with Tobiasen and pertinent emails between Tobiasen and myself and other information that would assist the commission in their investigation. I honored the commission's request and turned over what they wanted. To put some things into perspective for this podcast, Judge Tobiasen and another judge, Amy Cellini, are currently under investigation by the Judicial Commission for basically conduct unbecoming a judge. That investigation is separate and apart from this investigation that I will be discussing today. According to public documents filed with the Supreme Court of Nevada, Dominic Gentile, the attorney for Las Vegas Justice Court Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiasen stated in motions that the Nevada Commission on Judicial Discipline asserts that, by including in its pleadings, allegations of criminal conduct by Judge Tobiasen, including involvement in purported murder plots and alleged admissions to previous personal participation in prostitution, drug trafficking, and addiction. On March 31, 2020, according to the documents, Tom Bradley, the prosecutor for the Nevada Commission on Judicial Discipline, wrote in a letter addressed to Dominic Gentile, Tobiasen's attorney, that, I wish to note that the commission's investigator informed Judge Tobiasen's former counsel, Bill Terry, that the instant complaint was filed by Connie Land, a former friend of the judge, that the interview would involve subjects discussed in the interview that Judge Tobiasen gave to Doug Papa, which is already in the public domain and also that the current investigation was not related to the issue in the Tobiasen slash Cellini suspension case. Moreover, you are aware that the commission's investigation may extend to any manner that is, in the determination of the commission, reasonably related to an allegation of misconduct contained in the complaint. On May 4, 2020, according to the documents, the commission determined, after a very thorough investigation, to forego the investigatory interview of the petitioner, which is Judge Tobiasen. Essentially, the commission determined, based upon the substantial evidence already adduced in the investigation, that an investigatory interview was unnecessary. Nevada law does not require the commission to conduct an investigatory interview in all circumstances, particularly when a judge is being uncooperative in scheduling her interview, thereby delaying the judicial proceedings against her. According to the documents, Also, on May 4, 2020, the commission voted to require that Judge Tobiasen respond to the confidential complaint within 30 days. Accordingly, on May 8, 2020, the commission sent to Judge Tobiasen's counsel of record by United States Mail a copy of the underlying confidential complaint along with the entire evidentiary record, including all investigation reports, witness interview transcripts, audio recordings of petitioners' media interviews, and documentary evidence relied on by the commission in making the above-mentioned determination. This provides the judge an opportunity to explain her side of the story in lieu of answering questions at an investigatory interview. According to the documents that were filed with the Supreme Court of Nevada, the commission decided to move forward with its disciplinary proceeding for four main reasons. First, There is evidence of recent witness intimidation and threats made by email and social media sites by an unknown person or persons which greatly concerns the commission and may adversely affect any potential hearing should the commission determine that formal statement of charges should be filed in the future. To be clear, the commission is not aware of who is behind these threats. Based upon confidentiality of the investigation, the commission is unable to provide more detail in the motion. The Commission is well aware of the Court's presumption against sealing records. The Commission, however, believes that the Court's need for a full and complete record and the petitioner's right to confidentiality demonstrates the need to
to allow the commission to file the investigatory record under seal. Second, a great deal of the evidence came directly from the Judge Tobiason's admissions of misconduct that were publicized by the media. It is important to note that the petitioner's interviews were audio recorded by the journalist, and these recordings are included in the investigatory records being sent to the petitioner. These admissions alone point to potential serious violations of the revised Nevada Code of Judicial Conduct. Third, the Commission's investigation of the underlying complaint has led to the discovery of significant additional evidence against the judge. Although this new evidence is confidential by law, however, the Commission will be pleased to file the entire investigatory report under seal if the court believes it will be of assistance to this court in resolving the issues before it. Fourth, there have already been a number of delays in moving this proceeding forward. Beginning on February 24, 2020, the Commission has unsuccessfully attempted to schedule a date and time to interview Judge Tobiason. The Commission believes that in order to best protect the rights of both Judge Tobiason, who is entitled to a prompt hearing, and the citizens of Nevada, who are entitled to protection against judges who violate the judicial code, this case should proceed without further delay. According to further documents filed with the Supreme Court of Nevada, in October 2016, after two people were murdered at Top Notch, the judge began to personally investigate the case because she believed that Valentine had committed the murders. In 2017, she contacted Connie Land, the mother of one of the murder victims, and convinced her to transmit all of the text messages that, one, Ms. Land had exchanged with her daughter prior to her death, and two, all the text messages Ms. Land exchanged with the police detectives who were investigating her daughter's murder. The judge even utilized quote-unquote burner phones to secretly communicate with Ms. Land and others. Judge Tobiason also claimed that, one, some of the Metro vice detectives were protecting certain pimps in exchange for bribes and sex with prostitutes, and two, that the police forced a witness to allege that she, Judge Tobiason, bribed the witness to falsely implicate Valentine. Okay, I, I want to say something here. That's factually incorrect that they have filed with the court because the top-notch murders had nothing to do with the murders of Sidney Land and Nehemiah Kaufman that they're describing here. They occurred at a different location. The one murder that happened at top-notch happened in September of 2016, so that's not correct what they have there in the court record. I'll continue on with what's in the court record. Judge Tobiason's interviews disclosed the following admissions. In the summer of 2015, Judge Tobiason's daughter began to frequent an unlicensed club called Top Notch. After learning about the club, the judge staked out the establishment where she recorded license plate numbers and vehicle make and models of patrons. The judge even trailed the patrons to determine where they lived. Later in 2015, the judge determined that Shane Valentine was running an underage prostitution ring out of Top Notch. Judge Tobiason then began to contact a number of Metro vice detectives and insisted that they investigate and prosecute Valentine. At times, the judge would discuss her concerns about Valentine when vice detectives appeared in her chambers to request search warrants in unrelated cases. When Judge Tobiason learned that Valentine had been attempting to contact her daughter, the judge telephoned Valentine's lawyer and threatened that if Valentine calls her a daughter again, quote, she will take care of it herself because the police were not helping her. She also stated on one occasion she went to Shane Valentine's house and kicked in the door. In those interviews, Judge Tobiason openly discussed her willingness to flout the law, stating, quote, if I'm ever going to prison, I promise you it's going to be worth it, unquote. She also stated, I gave you, the reporter, information that was never meant to be made public. I'm ruined. Judicial discipline will use this to remove me from the bench. So, from the documents filed with the court, we now know that the Judicial Commission's investigative results pertaining to Judge Tobiason is under seal and not included in the public record at this time. Also sealed from public record is the complaint that Judge Tobiason has to answer with her attorney. Tobiason was given 30 days to reply from May 8th of 2020. Today is June 8th, 2020. Top Notch was mentioned in the court documents as it pertains to Judge Tobiason. Here are excerpts from Judge Tobiason's recorded interview with me from May of 2018 
where she discusses Top Notch. I have 2015, my daughter starts hanging out at a place in what we call Chinatown here in Las Vegas called Top Notch. It was a hip hop clothing store that when I looked into it, realized it was not really a clothing store, it was a front for an unlicensed club and also that they, on a regular basis, had young local high school girls hanging out in the club, um, dancing. There were strip, there were stripper poles in the back of the club. There was a full bar. There were, you know, at night, if you watch the alley behind the club, you would see the people come in, you know, typical Mercedes, Range Rovers, Bentleys, Rolls Royce, whatever. They'd all pull in and you'd see the the people that were getting out, and you could see exactly what was going on. They'd go in through the alley back door, and it was, in fact, an unlicensed club. Um, so in July of 2015, I start contacting detectives in Bright, asking them about this particular establishment. They tell me they have no knowledge of it whatsoever. I gather some additional information, find out that the two men who are running this club both are convicted pimps, and uh, one of whom has had a case in front of me. He was a 34-year-old. I take that information to the police. I say, listen, these guys have young girls from, you know, local high schools hanging out in here every night. And from my understanding, they're entertaining in this unlicensed club. And... At one point, one of the vice officers apparently walked in there about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I can assure you there was no activity going on, and reports back to me that it definitely appears to be suspicious. That's the only thing that was ever done in the entire year and three months or so that I was giving information to vice. They never follow up. They never do anything else. Um, so my daughter at some point says she's going to start working here. I tell her, you know, I make it very clear. It is not a legitimate business. And I make it very clear that she's risking a lot for our family by hanging out with these kind of people. I also am in a very precarious position because doing everything I can to keep it so that we have a relationship and I don't alienate her. So what I do is I allow her to go and work there, but I watch it. I sit, I watch while she's there. And after about three weeks, she says she doesn't want to go back. And I tell her, good, don't go back. Um, so, but from my understanding, even after that, you know, occasionally she would hang out there. They would go hang out in the club. It was kind of like a hookah lounge slash strip club. Um, so I continue to tell the police this. I watch the back alley. I get license plate numbers, vehicle makes the models, tell them what's going on, get the information on Marlon Brown and Red, and, uh, you know, express my concern repeatedly that there are 30-something-year-old pimps running this unlicensed club with all these underage girls hanging out there. And, the, and it's interestingly enough, the first time that I took the information to the police, I wasn't so concerned because I figured within a week, the police would be shut down. Well, clearly that didn't happen because I subsequently learned that not only did the police know about this place when I first started giving them information, they knew about a lot of places like this. And they were kind of untouchable. There were certain pimps that were untouchable. And then there were certain pimps that they would go after. The pimps that were untouchable, from my understanding, is the pimps who would play the game. They would pay the price. They would, you know, offer their girls. And they would get to do whatever they wanted, despite the fact that they were targeting, you know, judges, daughters, cops, daughters, etc. I learned pretty quickly that Shane Valentine was also untouchable. No matter what I said to the police about him, they never went after him. Um, so this is about September. This goes into September, October of 2015. Then my daughter kind of quits hanging out there. Occasionally she would go there, but mostly she wasn't going there. Um, December of 2015, I still continued to give information even when my daughter was no longer going there. So they figured 
not just my daughter, that was in jeopardy. So September 26th of 2016, it was a Sunday, I get a search warrant call from homicide. About halfway through the search warrant, we do telephonic search warrants here. About halfway through the search warrant, they give the address and the name of the location of the homicide. That location was Top Notch Clothing Store, the place that I had started to talk to Vice about July of 2015. It's now September 2016. Um, so Top Notch was still going strong as an after hours club with underage girls. And lo and behold, there's a murder there. So I get off the phone, I call, I call the vice sergeant, or I'm sorry, the homicide sergeant back and I explained to him that, you know, I was concerned about my name being on the search warrant because these people knew who I was and they had kind of tried to get their hooks into my daughter. Um, but they were, had, you know, most likely gotten their hooks into other girls. Well, Ma'am, before you and, go any further, let me interrupt you. Where, where was Top Notch located at? At this point in time, Top Notch, Top Notch had moved. When I first, when my daughter first was aware of it and I was first aware of it, it was on Spring Mountain. I can get you the full addresses, but it was on Spring Mountain and it was uh, between Valley View and Arville in what we call Chinatown. And then by the time it had the murder, the murder was there. It had moved to a location at the corner of Flamingo and Decatur and it was on the southeast corner in a strip mall behind like a Blueberry Hill breakfast restaurant and stuff like that. It was a little strip mall. And again, I can get you the full addresses okay. um, if you need them. So the murder happens there. Anyway, so that was October 26th. The following day, which was a Monday, I contact Detective Blues and I'm pissed. And I said to him, I go, oh, big guy. I said, I assume you heard about the murder at Top Notch. I'm not quite sure why you have blown me off for all this time. I go, but maybe now I have your attention. And I said, maybe now, since there's been a murder at Top Notch, and I asked you guys to investigate that a year ago, year and a half ago, and you knew what was going on there, I said, maybe now you'll investigate Shane Valentine. I said, he's out on bail on a burglary charge. He's got multiple felony convictions from when he was a juvenile and certified up as an adult. He's pimped out one judge's daughter. He's pimped out multiple police officers' daughters. He tried to pimp out my daughter. He's targeting certain families. And you guys just don't care. And I said, I have information on a girl who is at this moment working as a prostitute for him while he's out on bail on a burglary. Maybe you could do some investigation and do something about it. So he tells me he'll be at my office on Thursday afternoon. Thursday comes and goes, no call, no show. And what detective was that? So that, that was Detective Kelly Bluth. Bluth. Bluth, okay. All right. So that following Sunday, coincidentally, I was at the jail doing something else. And I run into Paul Diaz working overtime at the jail. And I was not nice. And I walked to him and I said, I have a question. I said, how can you guys keep fucking blowing me off? I go, I've been bringing you information on these guys trying to pit out underage girls. I go, which is your big, you know, talking point on the news. And I said, for over a year now. And I go, you guys have just completely blown me off for over a year. You've done nothing. You haven't investigated anything I've told you. You haven't made any effort to independently investigate or verify any of the information I've given you. And now you got a dead person at a place that I told you about over a year ago that was an unlicensed club. I go, I don't understand. And he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I go, he goes, oh. and I go, I talked to Blues on Monday. I go, he was supposed to come to my office. And once again, no call, no show. And he said, well, he's out of town. And I go, well, he's got a phone, doesn't he? And so he said, we'll come to your office next week. So the following week, which would have been the first week of October 2016, they come to my office. And it's Albiez, Kelly Booth, and Greg Flores. And I give them information on a girl. The same girl I told you about earlier, whose dad was a police officer who was friends with my daughter. 
Okay. I give them her name, her dad's name, all of her information, and again, I give them Shane's information, where he lives, what his story is. Who was the name, ma'am? Who, who, was the, who was the name of the cop whose daughter was being pimped out? His name is Ty Bowden, B-O-W-D-E-N. I don't understand. Why would a pimp be pimping out daughters of cops and a judge? It seems like the stupidest thing to do in the world. What, why was he doing that? No, actually, if you know you're protected, and it's actually not the stupidest thing in the world. It's the smartest thing in the world because I'm the only one that has ever been willing to come forward because everybody else is, A, in denial about the fact that it's happening, or B, cares more about their job, their political career, or their public reputation than their kids. And I had told my daughter in December of 2015, I love my job, I would like to do my job for a long time, but I will lose my job in a heartbeat to save you. And I told her, I go, one of these pimps gets you, I will lose my job, I will lose my freedom, I will lose my life if that's what it takes to get you back. Detective Bob. I, uh, I will get you back. Okay, Detective. If I can't get you. You got Molly Mall paying off these cops to protect his people and his girls, and go after the other pimps. Right. Shane Valentine works under Molly Mall, so he's protected. It explains. And if you've got these kinds of kids, their parents aren't going to come forward because their parents are embarrassed. See, my embarrassment comes from the fact that we have a police department and a DA's office who will allow this to happen. They know it's happening. They pretend they don't. And they allow our kids, they allow their own colleagues' kids to get trafficked. And then they go on the news and talk about their, you know, passion for going after these human traffickers when they're sitting back watching it. I actually subsequently learned that there were cops who hung out at Top Notch at the club. With the underage girls. Mm -hmm. If someone was to talk to Marlon Brown, I'll bet he'd tell him, I actually kind of like Marlon. Marlon actually protected my daughter. Now listen, if my daughter had been 18, I guarantee he wouldn't have. But he used to tell my daughter all the time, he's like, I have mad respect for your mom. She always treated us with respect, and we were in court, in court with her. Who is this guy? Which, which guy is this? Uh, who is that guy? He was a pimp. He was the one who owned Top Notch. But he actually, he wouldn't let my daughter drink. He wouldn't let her party. He would let her sit back there and load the hookahs. <laughs> you know, he let her hang out there. But according to her, he uh, kind of shielded her from the other stuff, uh, you know. I, I'm not, I don't think the guy deserves any freaking awards, but I do appreciate the fact he didn't beat my daughter up and put her out on the strip. His, fir his first <laughs> name is Marlon? Yeah. Marlon Brown? I mean, he, he protected my daughter more than the cops did, I can tell you that. Who was the judge's name? That's pretty what, sad. What was the judge's name whose daughter was also being pimped out? What was her name? Michelle Lovett. Here are excerpts from my interview with Judge Tobiasen where she discusses Shane Valentine and underage prostitution. Okay. Uh, my involvement in this started about the summer of 2015. I, as a justice of the peace, had a case in front of me where a judge's daughter was a victim of a brutal beating by two female defendants. It turns out that those two defendants worked for a pimp by the name of Shane Valentine, as did the judge's daughter. Um, the pimp who was at the scene of the initial beating and was actually directing the girls to inflict the beating on this judge's daughter was never charged. Um, one of the two girls, whose name was Sophia Faraci, died prior to the preliminary hearing. She was the daughter of a guy by the name of Vinnie Faraci, who went to federal prison with a guy by the name of Rick Rizzolo. Faraci, uh, his dad or family were enforcers for the Gambino crime family, which is interesting considering his daughter was a prostitute for Shane Valentine, who 
initially I thought was just some thug. Um, so we have the preliminary hearing. In the middle of the preliminary hearing, four African American guys come in, sit in the back row, and start, you know, staring at the the judge's daughter who's testifying. And I kick them out of my courtroom, and in fact, had them escorted out of the entire courthouse. One of those people was Shane Valentine. At the time, my daughter was a sophomore at Bishop Foreman High School here in Las Vegas, and she was very good friends with a girl, um, also the, a sophomore, whose dad was a police officer at Metro. This girl, from what I understand, and I didn't know at the time, but I subsequently learned, was also working as a prostitute for Shane Valentine. So we've got a judge's daughter and a police officer's daughter. Somehow Shane Valentine becomes aware that I have a daughter. And within about two weeks of that hearing, my daughter is introduced to Shane Valentine by the other girl, um, the police officer's daughter that was her friend. December 2015, my daughter comes to me, says to me that she met a guy the night before she went to his house, apparently was sent to him by the people at Top Notch to get a fake ID, or at least by people she had met at Top Notch. That person was Shane Valentine. Now, she had met him, but she would not really had much interaction with him. Um, on this particular night, she goes over there to get a fake ID, and he starts, you know, talking to talk, and I just kind of giving her a heads up about what that would sound like and what that would look like. And he starts talking to talk and tells her that he's going to teach her how to, that she was born with a silver spoon in her mouth, and he was going to teach her how to work the strip, and she was going to make money for him. And she said, no, that's not my thing. I'm not doing that. There were some pretty choice words exchanged between the two, and then the next morning she advised me of what had happened, and I was very grateful that, thank God, she was home safe, and we had a lengthy conversation about, again, the risks that she was taking hanging out with these kinds of people and what it would require of me if one of them were to get her. I then immediately contacted Vice again, and this was probably the fifth or sixth time I had contacted them in this particular period of time, July to December of 2015, contacted them immediately, gave them his name, the address where she had gone, the fact that he had drugs and guns in the house and he was an ex-felon, and the conversation that he had had with my daughter, and the fact that it was clear that he was also had a, that he also had other girls working for him. Uh, that they, they did nothing. They said they would look into it. Um, I subsequently learned that not only did they know who he was, he was pretty much untouchable, and they never even queried the address because they never had any intention of going after him. For a long period of time, I thought it was just they were lazy or they judged me because, you know, they figured why is she let her daughter do this. Um, you know, my theory was they should understand that when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, you try to do everything in your power to keep your child talking to you. Because the minute you alienate them, you basically send them into the lion's den. Um, February, that scared my daughter. And I would say starting then, she really started um, separating herself from the hookah lounges and these after hours clubs and was kind of breaking away from that. I learned that he's got an outstanding bench warrant on a domestic violence case in front of me where he beat up a girl at a place called Panorama Towers, which is notorious for pimp and prostitution activity, clear from the facts of the case that she was a prostitute working for him. Um, he beats her up, security guard comes to her aid, he then leaves, sends her pictures of him with guns, threatens to kill her, says she's never going to be safe. Um, she gives a statement to the police basically that, you know, she's terrified. She's afraid to leave her house because she's so afraid he's going to kill her. Um, May of 2016, Shane Valentine gets picked up on those warrants, um, bails out on the burglary case, pleads guilty to the battery domestic violence case in front of me, and I recuse 
But during that conversation, I had brought counsel into my chambers to explain to them, you know, the circumstances around this guy and my concerns for my daughter. And the DA at that time says to me, Judge, this is the guy who picked out the other judge's daughter. Who was that DA? Who was that DA's name? Who was that DA? That was Hagar Trujillo. She just happened to remember that he was the one on the other case, that he was the pimp, that even though he wasn't charged, she remembered his name. I had never made the connection until that moment. Now, mind you, I am telling the police about Shane now for six months. And then I think, then I learned this detail and I freak out because now I realize, because I always had believed he was targeting certain types of girls or certain families. Now I knew for sure. So I called Vice again and I said, I have just learned that he is the same guy who pimped out the other judge's daughter. And they seemed to be shocked. However, I now know that they knew exactly who he was and exactly who he had pimped out when I first gave his information to them. They knew he was the guy who had pimped out this judge's daughter. They knew that he had never been charged. They had never submitted a case on him, and they'd never gone after him. Um, so, let's see. About a month later, he comes back to court, and I rec- I had taken the plea on the case. Because the case was negotiated, I had taken the plea, and I had explained to the attorneys that so there was, you know, I was con- there was a conflict, and I would never put him in jail. I didn't want to recuse because I wasn't sure if he was aware of the relationship. Both parties agreed that since the case was negotiated and it was just a misdemeanor, that I would take the plea, and if there was ever a time that the time needed to be imposed, I would, you know, recuse. By the first status check, I had decided that I was going to recuse anyway because there was nothing good for me being on this case. And I had learned some other information by that time. So when he comes back for his first status check, I recuse. Later that day, he starts contacting my daughter from a blocked phone number. She had not heard from him for some time, probably since the warrant went out in February. So she calls me immediately. She says, was Shane in court today? I said, yes, he was. She said, he's been contacting me. So he called her two or three times from two or three different numbers. The first time he called, she said, who or she he texted, messaged her. She said, who is this? He said, it's Sugar. That's Sugar Shane. She blocks him. He then messages her from another number, basically, why the fuck are you going to do that? She blocks him again. I can't remember if he did a third number or if it was just the two, but she contacted me immediately. I then called Vice. And I told them, who'd you, again, ma'am, uh, who'd you talk to in Vice? Who were the detectives you're talking to? On uh, that, the, the majority of the time I spoke to detectives Bluth and Biet. That would be Kelly Bluth and Al Biet. Little did I know at this time that they were both subjects of the federal investigation. I had no idea because right. it hadn't been made public yet. Um, so then I, I had also talked to Kathy Healy, I had talked to Greg Flores, I had talked to several others, you know, in passing. But those were the blue, BS and Blues were the ones I took most of the information to, but I had given information to Flores and I had given information to Healy. Um, I also had talked to um, a detective by the name of Van Cleef. But, um, so at this time I called Blue and BS again. And I tell them that he was in court. And as soon as he left my court, he started contacting my daughter. I go, I don't understand why you guys won't do anything. And so um, there's this part, I mean, I'll say it, and I know it's being recorded, but you know, at the point that this story gets reported, there's certain things that, you know, hopefully we can talk about not discussing just for my daughter's protection, you know? Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I contacted his attorney because it was now going on a year that I had been calling Vice and that they had done zero, absolutely nothing. So 
Uh, do me, I, ma'am, I, ma'am, I, hold on for a second. Before you go any further, I don't, I don't want you to lose track. But can, can you um, phonetically spell the names of the as best you can of the vice cops you spoke to? I know Al B S is B E A S, but who were the others? That's correct. Kelly Bluth is K E L L Y B L U T H. He is a man. His wife is a uh, prostitute. She's a D A. Her name is Jacqueline Bluth. Um, then there's Kathy Huey. Kathy, I think, is with a C and not a K, and the last name is H-U-I. Gregory Flores, F-L-O-R-E-S. Greg Flores is one of the most corrupt individuals I've ever had the displeasure of learning about. Um, then there was a Van Cleef, and I'm sorry, I don't know his first name. It's D-A-N-B-L-E-E-F. Okay. So I contact Shane Valentine's attorney. It's about July now of 2016. And because I know that the cops at this point aren't going to do anything. I call his attorney and I said, hey, you might want to get your client a message that if he talks to my, if he calls my daughter again, I'm going to take care of it myself. <laughs> so he does. He gives them a message. <laughs> uh, that, you know, we don't really want to report that. But you know, I was at the point where I thought, if this guy's going to continue to mess with my daughter, clearly the police don't give a shit. They're not going to protect her. I spent a year trying to get them to do some sort of independent investigation and shut these places down. That I had given them, Shane Valentine was associated with a place called Milk Money, which is the same kind of thing as Top Notch. You know, it's like a front. They use all these clothing stores and strip malls and at area malls that look like clothing stores from the front, but they're actually unlicensed clubs. And they're all over town. Who, are you married to a, a, a Metro cop? He's retired. And no, he didn't help me. He's, he's not helping you? <laughs> he hasn't helped me through any of this. I was the one who went to Shane Valentine's house kicking the door. I was the one who went to the cop. I was the one who followed my daughter. I was the one who made sure she was safe. No, he didn't help me. Why not? What does he think about all this? I can't ask. I can't answer that question for you, because he probably thought I was nuts. Because he probably judged my daughter rather than wanting to save her. Um, because we're just two very different kinds of people. He'd rather put his head in the sand like everybody else, and that's just the way it is. And is his name? Is, is his name Tobiasen? That's his name. Yeah, it's, his first name's Todd. Last name's Tobiasen. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I heard of the name, but I don't, I don't know him. He's a nice guy. He just, you know, he doesn't, he just like, he's like 90% of the rest of the population. He's a sheep. In the court documents, the commission states, in these interviews, Judge Tobiasen openly discussed her willingness to flout the law, stating, quote, if I'm ever going to prison, I promise you it's going to be worth it, unquote. That statement is taken out of context. Here is an excerpt from my interview with Judge Tobiasen where that phrase is mentioned and why. We've got Joe Lombardo who's trying to suggest that I'm involved in drug trafficking and that they're going to file charges against me for interfering with an investigation for telling people not to talk to vice detectives because they're dirty. Mm-hmm. They put an info con out on my car saying, they don't put my name, they know it's my car, but they say, be on the lookout for this car, basically it's involved in a drug trafficking investigation. And how I found this out is I was doing a search warrant for a narcotics detective, and he asked me if I had a certain car still, and I said no, but I just bought this particular car. And he goes, that's weird, we just got this info about this, you know, the same kind of car being involved in drug trafficking. And I go, well, I have the only one in town. What kind and he of, goes, well, clearly it's not you. What kind of car is that? Clearly, it's a Dodge Demon. Wow, Dodge Demon, yeah. Uh-huh. And so then I talked to an attorney who had talked to Joe Lombardo and advised me that Lombardo was suggesting that I was involved in drug trafficking. And then I realized that, in fact, that wasn't me that they were talking about. And you're I not... I can assure you... And you're not involved in I'm drug trafficking, sure. right? I can assure you. I can assure you that I am not involved in drug trafficking, never have been, and never need to be, never want to be. 
I've always joked and said, if I'm ever going to go to prison, I promise you it's going to be worth it. What, and what, that would not be worth it. What, what do you, why do you think Lobato's telling people you, you're involved in drug trafficking? He told this particular attorney that they know that I meet with this guy who has prior drug convictions. And they, they mentioned a place that I meet him, which is a bar in Henderson. I was so pissed off. I go, first of all, I've known that guy since I was 17 fucking years old. I said, his priors are for marijuana. And he's been my friend forever. He builds race cars. And he actually was getting me some estimates. Thank God I have them. The commission states in one of the court documents that Judge Tobiasen claimed that the police forced a witness to allege that she, Judge Tobiasen, bribed the witness to falsely implicate Shane Valentine. I believe what the commission is referring to here is a May 13, 2018 email that Judge Tobiasen sent me referring to Ariane Zappia, whose sister Frankie, Tobiasen claimed, was involved in the Land Kaufman murders. In that email, Tobiasen wrote that, quote, Days later, she, Ariane Zappia, starts making allegations that I tried to bribe her to say Shane was involved in the double homicide, despite the fact that a full 10 months before my first conversation with her, she gave a statement to homicide. Tobiasen stated in that email to me that Las Vegas Metro Police Vice Detective Greg Flores and Ariane's stepfather, retired Metro Police Officer Dan Giersdorf, forced and threatened Ariane to accuse the judge of bribery. In February of 2019, I conducted an on-the-record interview with Ariane Zappia. Here is an excerpt from that interview with Ariane. And who are we talking call. about now? Who is this person? Melanie Tobiasen. I sat down with her. I met with her at a sushi restaurant. I brought my son, and we're sitting down. Um, she orders garlic edamame, and she orders a couple sushi rolls. I just got a drink. We're talking for a little bit, and then she pulls out this wad of cash, and she puts it back in her purse. And she's like, she puts her arms on the table. She's a real petite person, really, really, really small person with big lips. And she puts her arms on the table and she's like, I have to ask you something. She's like, I admire what you've done. I've, I've looked at the cases. I've read what you've written. I, I admire what you've done. And I want to make that very clear. And I was like, oh, thank you. I'm like, it's not for ad- admiration or to seem like a hero. It's just a matter of trying to right some wrongs and do right by somebody that never wronged me. Being a voice for someone that doesn't have a voice anymore. And living that lifestyle, and I'm not at all saying that Sydney lived that lifestyle, but being a victim of that, and I've never victimized myself, I don't sit and say I'm a victim, but in theory, in this situation, that's what I'm classified as when it comes to Anthony. Um, I'm like, I, I just don't want to see, if I could prevent somebody else from going through this, I want to. And I'm not ready right now, but I hope one day, I can share my story and people can know that regardless of what people are going to say about them, they're not alone and there's someone that believes in them. And I will I can be that person. I just don't know how to go about it because of my own background. And who, is, who wants to listen to a recovering addict slash prostitute? No one wants to hear from me. She's like, I do. And this is what I want you to do. Money's not an issue, but I know it is for you. You're a struggling single mom. I have the means to make your worries, your struggles go away. All I need you to do is go down to homicide, tell them that because you were fresh off of drugs and you didn't have a complete clear mentality that you want to not change your story, but recant on it. And that's what she tells you. And I will tell, and I will tell you what to say and what to do. And I'll give you the money to do it. And I looked her dead in her face and I told her, I said, do you understand what changing my story means? It means I lied. Right. And that means that I'm not sure of anything I said. And they're not going to believe me. They didn't even believe me the first time I went in. They're not going to believe me now. And the little hamster in my head gets going. And now I'm kind of scared. And I tell myself, don't say anything too crazy. Hold on. Just tell her that you'll think about it and you'll let her know. And that's exactly what I said. And I ended our meeting and I told her, I was like, it's getting late. I need to take my son home. I've got to give him a bath, get him in bed. I do have work in the morning because I did. Um, I'll let you know this is a lot to ask of me. I'm going to think about it. Before I leave, 
Sushi. We're standing outside right in between the sushi restaurant and the ice cream store. It's like a yogurt store, ice cream shop thing next door. We're standing at, at the table right in front of it. And she's like, you can't tell anyone, including Connie, we had this conversation. And I told her I wouldn't. And what, would, um, what was it that she wanted you to change? What, what, what's the testimony she wanted she you to never, change? She never told me. She told me that once I accepted the money, that she would tell me what it was that she wanted me to say. I never accepted the money, so I never knew what she wanted me to say. Do you think it had something to do with Galassi or somebody else? Oh, no. Um, what she wanted, the only thing she did tell me is she wanted me to change, saying that I don't believe that Shane Valentine had involvement and to tell them that I knew Shane had involvement and she would give me the reasons why. Okay. Here is Connie Land, whose daughter, Sydney, was one of the victims in the still unsolved double murder discussing Judge Tobiason. I met Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiason when she reached out to me via messenger in May of 2017. I was so grateful she did. Finally, it appeared I would have someone in position of power who also believed there was corruption happening. As an influential judge, she lent credibility to the cause that we would undoubtedly fight for. Maybe we would finally see justice for Sydney and Nehemiah and expose the forces trying to bury this corruption. I believed her, and I trusted her, and I confided in her. She was absolutely the peace and the support that I desperately needed. I believed and I appreciated the information Judge Tobias had made public in exposing the corruption and cover-up in the LVMPD Vice Criminal Intelligence Division, DA, office and potentially the local FBI office as accurate and truthful. It was the right thing to do. What people didn't know is that while she's going public about crooked cops and the DA's office, she is involved in her own corruption, cover-up, and unethical practices. It appears she used my vulnerabilities concerning my daughter's murder for her own personal agenda I believed she genuinely wanted to help my family, and I was so wrong. All that was left in her wake was paranoia and dashed hope. It feels like she is the master of puppets. I really did believe she wanted to help me, and there are so many things she never told me and things she intentionally kept secret. It was only until after reading the articles in the Baltimore Post-Examiner that I began to see the possible motives for Judge Tobias in contacting me. I learned through my readings that Melanie and her daughter Sarah had some very dangerous and volatile interactions with Shane Valentine since their initial encounters in May of 2015. This was 18 months before the murders. I was also shocked to hear a sitting judge had called Shane Valentine's attorney in 2016 and gave Shane a threatening message if that wasn't bad enough, the judge went to Shane, Shane Valentine's house and kicked down or in his door. What is really going on between the judge, her daughter Sarah, and Shane Valentine? I know all too well of a mother trying to protect her child. But why would she put her daughter in harm's way by taunting a man she knows is so dangerous? The judge mentioned Sarah had a best friend named Allie Bowden. Her dad is an LVMPD cop. I read in the articles that Allie introduced Sarah to Shane. Allie allegedly worked as a prostitute for Shane Valentine. My heart skipped a beat when I read that. At the time of the murders, Allie Bowden may have been working as a prostitute for Nehemiah Kaufman. Sarah was also friends with Nehemiah. Pieces of this dark and sinister puzzle appear to be coming together. I was staring at the connections that could not be ignored. What was the real reason the judge contacted me in the first place? The judge told me so many times I could not trust Detective Dosh. She told me Detective Dosh was a longtime friend of Dan O'Geersdorf, Frankie Zappia's stepfather. She told me Dosh was a liar that could not be trusted. Do not tell him anything because he was never going to solve this case. These were the things I did not want to believe. She told me that she, she told me. She was getting evidence and details about the case from Detective Grimmett, and he was the only, only one I could trust and the only one that I should speak with at Metro. 
She told me over the next six months of our communication that she would share information he provided. She told me I could never tell anyone we were speaking and that if I told anyone what we discussed, it would put us both in danger. That me and my family were living in a state of paranoia and high anxiety. She said that I was being followed. My moves were being watched. The police were monitoring my phone calls, my messages, my social media. The police were watching my house. She said we needed to get burner phones so they could not follow our conversations. The fear of losing my child, my husband, or being killed myself was unbearable. I didn't know where to turn. Since the murders happened, I have desperately searched for help. Melanie knew that I had been to the FBI office on several occasions, trying to get them to take over this case. The corruption and negligence were becoming more apparent each day. She told me that her, quote, FBI friend, whom she had been talking to, was the head of the FBI investigation into the LVMPD and vice corruption probe. She told me that it was likely that the evidence in this case, my daughter's homicide, had already been destroyed and that the case would never be solved. One day she called and told me that her FBI friend that the FBI was finally taking over the murder investigation of Sydney and Nehemiah from Metro. Oh my gosh, I was so excited. Finally, finally, everything I had communicated with Detective Dodd, every, she told me her FBI friend needed every bit of documentation, photos, emails, texts, everything that I had. I needed to get this to her information to her ASAP so she could provide it to her FBI friend. This was going to was this going to be the moment that Sydney would get the justice that she deserved? I gave her everything. Melanie never provided any of my documentation to the FBI. She has stated in interviews that she has all of the correspondence between me and Detective Dosh. I later learned from the FBI that the FBI never ever requested the information from Melanie. They are, they had not, and we're not working on the murder investigation or even looking into it. There's another quick gasp of air before being forced under the water again. It is alleged that Melanie offered a bribe to an, an undisclosed amount to Arian Zappia in October 2017. She was to go back to homicide and change the statement she made with them in December of 2016, now stating Shane is the one who killed Sydney Land. I never did talk to Grimmett. I believe that once she knew I was not talking to Grimmett, nor sharing my information with them, she created the whole FBI story. It makes me wonder what her real motives are. Prior to my interview with Judge Tobiasen that occurred on May 7, 2018, on April 13th of 2018, KLAS-TV 8 News Now I-Team aired a segment of an interview with Judge Tobiasen where Tobiasen discussed her daughter, pimps, and the Las Vegas Metro Vice Cops. The following day, after that segment aired, Connie Land, who had been in contact with the FBI Las Vegas Division, received a call from FBI Special Agent Vanita Pandey, who at the time was assigned to the investigation of human trafficking. S.A. Pandey told Land that the FBI wanted the cell phone that Connie was using to communicate with Tobiasen. The FBI had possession of that phone for several months, it is unknown to this day why the FBI wanted Tobiasen's calls and text messages with Connie. Upcoming episodes will continue to focus on the unsolved 2016 Land Kaufman murders and Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiasen, as well as other topics. Thank you for listening.